All right, grace and peace, saints. Welcome to another installment of the book of Matthew. And once again, we're in Matthew chapter 13. And once again, we are looking at verses 1 through 23. We also looked at these verses in the last installment. But in this installment, we're going to look at the analogy that Jesus gives. We're going to interpret it. And then we're going to try to apply it to our lives. So if you have your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 13. Last week, or uh, in last installment, I should say, um, I've been missing a couple of weeks, we looked at how Jesus begins speaking in analogies to basically weed out certain people in the crowd and the disciples who were genuinely interested in the matters of the kingdom and the matters of God approach Jesus and ask him to interpret these various analogies. Sometimes they're called parables and that's the attitude that we need to have with the scripture. There are people who will not understand the word of God, but we want to be those few who step out and try to understand it. We want to go to church. We want to go to people in private and ask for interpretations. We want to ask for wisdom in James 1.5. We want to seek diligently how to interpret the scriptures in our private lives. So that's the subject we talked about in the last installment, just making an effort to understand the Word of God. But this time around, we're going to look at the analogy itself and see what Jesus had to say. So in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 1, it says, And in that day, Jesus, having gone out from the house, was sitting beside the sea, And large crowds were gathered to him, so that having stepped into the boat, he sat down, and all the crowd had stood upon the seashore. So this is a little bit of a different situation than you might see at a church. If you go to church on Sunday morning, everyone's going to be sitting down, and the speaker will be standing in front of everyone. Here, it's almost the other way around. Jesus is on a boat sitting down, and he's a little bit away from the shore, and he's going to be teaching this crowd who is standing on the shore. Verse 3, And he spoke many things to them in analogies. So this is where Jesus begins to speak a lot more mysteriously. Back in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, when he was giving what's called the Sermon on the Mount, it was very clear. He was teaching uh, exactly the truths of God in crystal clear language, but now he's going to start using these analogies to explain the truths of God, but in a more masked way, which is intentional on his part. But in Matthew 13, verse 3, he says, Behold, the sower went out for to sow, and in his sowing some fell beside the road, and the birds came and devoured them, but others fell upon the rocky ground, where it didn't have much earth, and immediately it sprang up out, because of its not having depth of earth. But the sun having arisen, it was scorched, and because of its not having root, it withered. But others fell upon the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them. But others fell upon the good ground, and it was giving fruit, some a hundred, but some sixty, but some thirtyfold. The one having ears to be hearing, let him be hearing. So this is the analogy of the sower. That's what Jesus is going to call it in verse 18. So immediately after this analogy, Jesus, uh, he gives like a little discourse for a couple of verses about how 
the kingdom of God, the, the secrets of the kingdom of God are given only to certain people because the disciples come up, only a few come up and ask Jesus to interpret this analogy. And Jesus meets that request. That's a promise we learn in James 1, 5, that when we ask for wisdom, when we lack wisdom, God gives it to us when we ask him. And so Jesus does interpret his own parable. If you look further down in the chapter, Matthew chapter 13, and beginning in verse 18. Now, before we get into Jesus's interpretation, the analogy he gave, it's about this guy who goes out to sow seed, and that just means he's going to go out and plant seed. And he lists four different situations, four different situations. Some seed falls by the road, some falls on rocky ground, some falls among thorns, and then lastly, some falls upon good ground. And there are different results based on where the seed fell. And so we're going to see how Jesus interprets that analogy. So if you look in Matthew 13 and verse 18, this is Jesus explaining his analogy. You therefore hear the analogy of the sower. Everyone hearing the word of the kingdom and not understanding, the evil one is coming and is snatching that having been sown in his heart. This is that having been sown beside the road. But that sown upon the rocky ground, this is the one hearing the word and immediately receiving it with joy. But he isn't having root in himself, but is temporary. But affliction or persecution beginning because of the word, immediately he is being snared. But the seed having been sown into the thorns, this is the one hearing the word, and the worry of this age and the deceit of riches is strangling the word, and it is becoming fruitless. But the seed having been sown upon the good ground, this is the one hearing and understanding the word, who indeed is bearing fruit, in doing some a hundred, but some sixty, but some thirtyfold. And that is his entire explanation of the analogy. In the following verse, 24, he goes into another analogy. So verse 23 is where we're going to stop. What we're going to do is explain a little bit about what Jesus just said here in these verses, but then I want to go over to Luke chapter 8, because in Luke 8, we see the same analogy but we get more insight on how to interpret it that I find very um, illuminating. But for right now, let's just look at what Jesus says here in Matthew 13. So the seed in this analogy is the word of the kingdom. And if you read in Luke 8, which we will in a little bit, the seed is called the Word of God. So this is the scripture or communication of God to humanity. And I believe it is talking about the saving gospel information. It is containing that content of saving faith that Jesus Christ is the divine, eternal Son of God who became man to rule on this world as the Christ, and that he died for our sins and physically rose from the dead. When we believe that, we receive eternal life and forgiveness of sins. We become born again. It is including that when we talk about the word of the kingdom or the word of God, but it is also containing things beyond that. This analogy 
does touch on the subject of initial salvation. But I believe it is more interested in the months and years after receiving initial salvation. This analogy is more focused on what we call progressive sanctification. How different humans react to the Word of God in their life, and some do better than others. Some react to it well, and some react to it poorly. And the seed, that's the Word of God, it's landing in these different places, and we there's four situations in these different terrains, the side of the road, the rocky ground, the thorns, and the good ground, these are different hearts of people. These are different, mm, I, don't, I don't know if I want to use the word personalities, but they are different ways of reacting and handling the intake of God's holy word. So these are like four different types of people and how they might react to the word of God when it is spoken to them. And so these are broad categories, and we're going to see moving forward that the first category, the seed that fell beside the road, these are people who do not believe unto salvation. That's going to be very clear when we go over to the book of Luke. And the next three categories, the seed that falls on the rocky ground, the thorny ground, and the good ground, these three are believers, people who have believed unto salvation. Luke is going to make that clear. Uh, that is not a common interpretation, by the way. Most Christians will say the first three categories are unsaved, and only the fourth category are truly saved individuals. Um, but I believe that is reading the our theology into the biblical text. And if we let the biblical text speak for itself, if we exegete what is there, I think we are forced to conclude that the last three, those two middle ones, the rocky ground and the thorny ground, are genuine believers, but they are believers who do not do well. In the, in the years after their conversion. So that's what I think this analogy is about. But head over to Luke 8, because we'll get some more insight from Luke chapter 8. And why don't we begin in verse 11, Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. This is Jesus explaining the same analogy but in the Gospel of Luke. Now, this is the analogy. The seed is the Word of God. Same basic thing we learned back in Matthew 13, the Word of the Kingdom. This is what we understand to be the Bible, the Word of God, the communication of God to us from heaven. Verse 12, But those beside the road are those hearing then the slanderer is coming and taking away the word from their heart so that not having believed, they shouldn't be saved. So the Bible teaches we are eternally saved when we hear and also believe the gospel. In this situation, the seed that fell beside the road, these are humans who hear the gospel, but Satan is doing his work to prevent them from believing. 
And because they do not believe what they have heard, they are not saved. So this first category of person in this analogy, the seed that fell by the road, these are people who do not believe unto salvation. I want to take a quick detour to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we learn that Satan makes an effort to prevent people from believing the gospel. So Satan wants to keep the unsaved unsaved, and he does that by preventing them from believing, and he wants to keep those who are believers who are saved, he wants to keep them confused, he wants to keep them um, sinning if he can manage it, but he would ideally prevent people from being saved altogether if he could do it with everyone. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, one moment, why don't we begin in verse 1, because of this, having this service, as we received mercy, we aren't despairing, but we renounced the hidden things of the shame, not walking in craftiness, nor using the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, recommending ourselves to every conscience of men before God. But even if our good message has been veiled, it has been veiled among those perishing, among whom the God of this age blinded the minds of the unbelieving that the light of the good message of the glory of the Christ, who is the image of God, shouldn't shine on them. So, here we're learning the same thing that we're seeing back in uh, Luke chapter 8, that the God of this age, and that's a lowercase g God, not that he has any real essence of deity, but he's functioning as the God of this age and of this world, and that's referring to Satan. Satan has blinded the minds of people so that they cannot believe the gospel. Now, Satan is the one doing it, but it's within the sovereignty of God and God's unconditional election. Um, Those whom God has chosen inevitably invariably believe the gospel, and those whom he has not chosen will not believe. Uh, But Satan is an instrument in that. And so Satan is not operating outside the sovereignty of God, but he is the agent who is actively blinding people from uh, believing the gospel. So that's what we're learning back here in Luke 8 and in Matthew 13. This first category of soil, these by the roadside, people are hearing the gospel. They're hearing there's this guy named Jesus who is truly God and truly man. They're hearing the claims that he is the Christ who will rule over the entire world one day. They're hearing the claim that his death on the cross was for our sins. It wasn't just a, an incident in history. It was a purposed um, event by God to atone for our sins. They're hearing that Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead and is alive and well today. They're hearing that, but they are not believing it. They are not considering it true. Satan has done some kind of work beforehand to uh, make them not believe. You know, maybe they heard something in college like, oh, this is a legend that developed over time, which is a lie, but it was propagated and the person thinks that's the case. And because of that, they're blinded, they're prevented from believing the gospel unto salvation. So that's this first category. That's what Luke tells us here in Luke 8, in verse 12, the slanderer, Satan, is coming and taking away the word from their heart so that not having believed, they shouldn't be saved. But let's keep reading. 
verse 13 of Luke 8, but those on the rock are those who, whenever they might hear, are receiving the word with joy, and these aren't having root, who are believing for a season, and they are departing in a season of temptation. So in this second category, um, the second category here is um, the rock or the rocky ground. And Luke tells us they believed for a while. And the word believe here is the same one used in the previous section, those who would not, Satan prevents them from believing so that they would not be saved. So the result of believing is being saved. And here it's saying that the rocky soil, uh, the rocky ground, it's a person who does believe, but later on they depart. And it's impossible to depart from something unless you were really there. Um, so this is, this is a believer. And if we're going to let the text exegete if we're going to exegete the text and let it speak for itself, I think we have to conclude um, that this person is saved. Uh, but they but they depart later on. Uh, there's a school of thought that argues if they depart later on, it means they were never truly saved in the first place. Um, but that would but the text does not suggest that. It just suggests that the person believed but later didn't believe. And so, um, this is a person who does hear and believe the saving gospel, but they depart from it later on. Um, they depart from the word of God. They, they quit. Um, they stop following Christ in some measure. And the reason why they do that is because um, they encounter a season of temptation. And if you compare this with the book of Matthew, Matthew refers to it as affliction and persecution because of the word. So here is one of the things that can take out a believer. It's something you have to prepare for yourself, and you also have to prepare for the fact that you may see other believers do this. But one of the things that can make a believer quit following Christ or back off from following the commandments of God, from obeying the word of God, is affliction or persecution because of the word of God, however form that takes. Uh, for example, today, a very common one might be the fact that the Bible clearly tells us that homosexuality is a sin, and that's something that we teach, and it's, um, it's, a, and it's an issue of morality. It's something that we avoid and we're going to teach other believers to repent of homosexuality if that's something they're engaged in. Well, that's a very unfavorable position in our world, in our culture, um, it's so much so that those who claim homosexuality is a sin, they are often belittled, persecuted, unfriended. In some cases, legal action is taken against them. And that's a form of persecution or affliction because of the word of God. Or if you believe in a literal interpretation of Genesis 1, which is the correct understanding of Genesis 1, it, it, it's a historical account. Um, it clearly says each day is a period of nighttime and a period of light. Um, and so that's clearly the interpretation we should have about creation. Well, that's a very, again, that's a very unpopular viewpoint in most of the unbelieving world. 
Um, that's belittled. It's looked down on. You're stupid. You're you're very small minded. You're unscientific. You're a science denier. One time someone called me a science denier. And that hurts. And we want to be accepted and we don't want our reputation to suffer. So there's this form of affliction or persecution that comes along, and it's a temptation to depart from the Word of God. It's a temptation to back off of being a disciple, to maybe go to a different church or um, maybe not take Christianity so seriously or maybe just reject it wholesale because it's so embarrassing for you or, or whatever the case is. So that's what's going on with this second category of um, person or terrain. Uh, this is the rocky ground. They they don't have they, the word of God is received with joy, but it it doesn't sink so deep into them that they hold on to it, even if it hurts. And so sometimes and oftentimes. Um, as we grow in the Word of God and receive it, you're going to encounter these seasons of affliction uh, that come from the Word of God. So this is the second category of person. Uh, they are genuine believers who depart in some measure from the Word of God uh, because of persecution or affliction. They, they do not want to suffer for the word of God. But let's keep reading in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. Let's look at the third category. But that having fallen into the thorns, these are those having heard and under worry and riches and pleasures of this life going on are strangled and aren't bearing fruit to maturity. And so in this category, um, I want to go back to Matthew 13 for a moment, but I think I'm going to come back to Luke 8, but Matthew 13 says, but the seed having been sown into the thorns, this is the one hearing the word and the worry of this age and the deceit of riches is strangling the word and it is becoming fruitless. And so again, uh, my interpretation is this is someone who does genuinely believe the gospel and is saved, but they do poorly in the years leading up to ultimately their death, their sanctifying years. But this type of person succumbs to a different problem than the rocky ground. The rocky ground quit because of persecution or affliction. The thorny ground has a different issue. This is a person who might not have a problem enduring affliction for the Word of God, but they they have the cares of this life. And so we have a few things listed here when we combine Matthew and Luke, but we have worry, riches, and pleasures of this life. Uh, Matthew calls it worry of this age, and that's basically worry, and then he also says the deceit of riches, which, again, is pretty much captured in riches. Riches are deceitful. Um, and that's just another way of saying that they're unpredictable. We chase after them, but we don't even know if we're going to get them. And there's a lot of delusion with uh, career advancement and business building and all of these things that the true matter uh, before us is that God is sovereign and he gives us what we need and he makes us rich and poor and everything in between whenever he feels like it. And we cannot make um, our 
career path what we want it to be um we can influence things we can we can obviously we can go to work and make money uh, which god calls us to but we have to accept the fact that there are thousands of variables beyond us you know we can't control if the company we work at goes under we can't control our boss's volition if he or she chooses to give a promotion to someone else we can't we can't um uh, you know prevent part of our house or car falling apart and we have to spend a lot of money suddenly um we can't determine the outcome of uh, the market. The market could go a certain direction and drastically change our economy and change our uh, jobs. So these things are just beyond us, and we have to accept that there's um, something deceitful about chasing after rich. Riches are an empty promise. Um, and even when we get them, that we find that they're not really all that satisfying. Uh, we find that in some cases, it makes our life worse. Uh, so it's very important to rec- uh, realize and recognize that uh, chasing after riches is a, a, a foolish thing to do. It's deceitful. It's something our flesh des- desires, but we have to recognize this is deceiving us. This is not the way it's presented is not the truth. Um, we're not we're not going to be able to get what we want, and even if we got it, it wouldn't really satisfy us the way we think it would. So the deceit of riches. But we have three things listed here if we just condense it. we got worry, riches, and pleasures of this life. And these, again, are things that can strangle the Word of God in a believer's life. So if you're a believer and you want to do well, you want to... Uh, persevere. You want to continue to bear fruit and bear a lot of fruit for God, which is um, desirable, right? This is what uh, Jesus says in the book of John. He says, in this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. And so we want to do very well in the areas that matter in life, Um, But if we want to continue to uh, digest the Word of God and apply it to our lives and get that healthy intake of the Word of God at church, um, we have to look out for these thorns. So we we have the worry of life, and uh, there's many things we can worry about. We can worry about having health care. We can worry about our children. We can worry about um, looking fit. We can worry about uh, living in a good slash bad neighborhood, if uh, you think of it that way. So there are these worries, um, and we ask God to help us when these things come up. Real quick, if you go over to 1 Peter 5, um, I don't want anyone to feel bad if they have certain concerns in life, or um, maybe another way to put it is when we do have concerns in life, well, what do we do with them? Well, in 1 Peter 5, uh, where is it? It's a really um, popular, oh, here it is in verse 7, casting all your worry, and it's the same word, back in Matthew 13, casting all your worry upon him because it matters to him concerning you. Um, So it's a combination of uh, praying and believing. I think we we almost believe our worries over to God, Um, believing in those promises like seek first the kingdom of God and these things will be added to you if you're worried about those particular provisions in life. So worry, chasing after money, and chasing after pleasure, these are things that can strangle the Word of God in the believer. Um, It looks different for different people. It comes in different shapes and sizes. Um, But when a believer becomes very entrenched in some kind of pleasure in life, and 
Um, it doesn't even necessarily have to be something sinful, um, but if they're very interested in a certain uh, pleasure in this life that they chase after and want more of, well, it can get in the way of attending church. It can get in the way of um, chewing on the Word of God, like when you could be thinking about the Word of God and mulling it over and spending time on that, you're focused on how do I get this pleasure? And it strangles the Word of God, and the Word of God becomes less present and less effective in our hearts because of this pleasure, this chasing after pleasure, um, or this constant worrying um, if you're constantly worried um, about this and about that and you're high strung, that's, again, it's going to get in the way. Your, your mind will be on these worries rather than your mind being on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, um, how to um, be devoted to your fellow brothers and sisters and like the things you can do to serve them and use your gift in the church. These things are pushed aside when you're worried, worried, worried. Um, well, how am I going to have enough money for this? And um, I don't know if that person likes me, and I have social anxiety, and I don't know if I can go to church because of X, Y, Z, and um, I'm really concerned about my, um, you know, my family situation, so i got to move to another town to reconcile with them, or whatever it is. I'm just kind of making things up off the fly. But these worries of life, um, they can strangle the Word of God, and it, it can slow and even halt your sanctification. And so we want to be on the lookout for these worries, pleasures, and riches. And riches, that's a really, um, right, that's a real easy one to understand. If you're going to chase after money, if you're going to... I don't know, take on two full-time jobs or start a business and just push your sanctification aside to get money or get fame or whatever, um, it is going to just kill the Word of God that's in your heart. It's, it's going to shoot your sanctification dead. Um, so we want to... Um, we want to... Pull our heart back from chasing after riches, which are deceitful anyway. Um, and I understand God created all things for us to enjoy. I'm not saying we have to be um, stoic. I'm not saying we can't enjoy a movie or enjoy um, a really delicious meal or something. But just keeping in mind um, that the pleasures of this world are not what ultimately satisfy us. And we need to, um, make sure we're eating the word of God, the bread that has come down from heaven regularly feeding on his flesh and blood, making that our go to, um, habit and practice, um, not letting the pleasures of this life strangle the word of God and its power in our lives. But this does happen to believers, and that's what Jesus is talking about here. There are some who do allow riches and pleasures and worries uh, strangle out the word of God, and because of that, they do not do well in their sanctification and will not do well at the uh, Bema of the Lord Jesus Christ when it time when it comes time to assess our lives and receive rewards. All right, Luke 8 and the final group of people here. Fifteen. Luke eight fifteen. But that in the good ground, these are such who, having heard the word in a heart of quality and good, are grasping it and bearing fruit with endurance. And Matthew says something very similar, right? So these are the individuals who hear the word of God. And again, these different terrains are talking about different terrains of heart, so to speak, um, what we're like 
as we react to the Word of God. But this last category, this is who we want to be. It's those who grasp the Word of God and hold on to it. Um, there's a word that the Bible uses very often when it talks about this process of sanctification, and it's, and it's the word abide, uh, or it's like remain. It's those who grasp the Word of God and hold on to it even when there's affliction or persecution. It's those who hold on to it even when there are, you know, there's potential to have riches, or there's this desire to have pleasures, or there are worries that are being thrown their way. They hold tight. They grasp the Word of God. They keep taking it in. They keep putting it into practice. They keep seeking after um, wisdom in the Word of God. These are the individuals who produce fruit. Um, this is uh, John 15, right? The um, First John talks about this a great deal, but John 15 is another good place for it. But in John 15, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the farmer. Every branch in me not bearing fruit, he is lifting it, and every one bearing fruit, he is cleansing, so that it may be bearing more fruit. You are already clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Continue in me, and I in you, just as the branch is unable to be bearing fruit from itself unless it is continuing in the vine. So neither can you unless you continue in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, the one continuing in me, and I in him. This one is bearing much fruit, because apart from me you aren't able to be doing, you aren't able to do anything. And so that's what we're seeing in this final terrain, this good ground. It's people who grasp and hold on to the word of God. They stick with it. They keep learning it. They keep putting it into practice. They keep sticking with Jesus. They keep believing in him. They keep trying to obey him. And when we do that, when we abide in him, when there's continuous abiding in him, we naturally produce fruit in our lives. We, we don't even have to like tighten our muscles to produce apples or anything like that. When we remain in the word of God and we remain learning and obeying and believing, we just naturally produce fruit. Um, these are various uh, words and actions, deeds that are acceptable to God. And because of that, we're making an impact and we're um, ultimately glorifying God and God will eventually reward us for that. So it is a, a very desirable state to be in, to be abiding and producing fruit. And we see um, that different Christians produce different amounts of fruit here in this analogy, right? Some 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. And I think that's just talking about the different um, quality and quantity of works that flow out of believers. Um, for example, if, um, if Paul is 100-fold, you know, I'm something like a one-fold. Uh, probably even less than that. But as we submit to the Holy Spirit in our walk, um, we can do it even more, and we can do it in a better way, and we can produce even more fruit, as John 15, as we just read, uh, suggests that those who bear fruit, um, God cleanses them so that they bear more fruit. And so we can actually even improve in this. If we're someone who's 30-fold right now, we can actually escalate that to 60-fold, I believe, just by further cooperation and submission to the Holy Spirit, abiding in Christ. All right, friends, I think that is all I have to say about this analogy, the analogy of the sower here in Matthew 13.
And so in the next installment, we will continue in Matthew 13, and we're going to look at more analogies. Jesus gives many analogies in this chapter to help us learn more about the kingdom of God and uh, what it's like. So um, we'll continue in Matthew 13 in our next installment. Well, until then, grace and peace to you, saints.